Welcome to podcast 23. I'm Heather Gorringe from Wiggly Wigglers and I'm co-hosting this show along with... Richard from Wiggly Wigglers. Indeed I am. And now I wanted to describe what the show was because I always say it's like the archers but real. But we've just got a new iTunes review and it's another five starer. Excellent. So I'm going to read that out to describe what the show's about. It's from Michael in Selsey. Wiggly Wigglers podcast, hugely informative about countryside matters and rural issues. Heather and Richard host an often hilarious half hour with the help of Phil, Monty and others of the Wiggly team and occasional visiting guests. Compulsive listening in our home when an early task on Monday mornings is to download the latest Wiggly podcast and rejoin the Giggly Wiggly team for another half hour of gentle learning and laughter. Five stars. It's a milker. Thank you very much, Michael from Celsi. What a great review. Yep. And we've had another one off Som, who turns out to be Tom. Yep. It's a silent H, so sorry about that, Tom. He's given us a five-star review, so if you want to see it, go and have a look on iTunes. And Tom has been sent his book because he won last month's competition. Oh, well done. So I hope you're enjoying How to Be a Bad Bird Watcher, Tom. So we've had so much feedback on last week's show. Yeah, some really good feedback. Yeah, over supermarket row with Dick and Farmer Phil. In fact, last night (laughs) at our pool match, you know I play pool every week. Yeah, yeah. I so wished I'd had the mobile recorder because in the middle of my pool match, so it's all pressure, I could hear them shouting at each other and pointing. When I looked over, they're pointing at each other. All I could hear was Phil saying, Well... They don't have to sign the contract, do they? <laughs> and Dick saying, what? Said, have you seen it in the press this week? It's Tesco Popoli or something. Yeah. <laughs> they were yeah. really cross. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's going to continue. So if you have got any comments, please let us have them. We can't actually bring them to you this week because we haven't got time. Because Bralis in Belfast is back. And now I have to mention that because we've had so many people saying, why did you call Richard Bralis in Belfast? Yeah. And it was because of Charlie Dimmock, you see. So he was doing a ground force, and so right. it was because of her. Yeah. Anyway, but you're back. But our intrepid reporter, Richard, has been off again. So tell us, Richard, what have you been up to well, this we, week? We sold Claire Short some Bokashi in a Bokashi bucket some time ago and had lots of correspondence between her office manager. And Claire Short's the MP for... For Ladywood, yeah. Birmingham. But Jessica, her office manager, wanted to know a bit more about Bakashi and what thing, and she wanted some really hard evidence, so I'd have to do a little bit of research and then send her a few extracts from bits and pieces to prove to her that it was a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But it occurred to us that it might be a great opportunity to have Claire Short do a little bit for our podcast. Like a scoop. A bit of a scoop, yeah, <laughs> a bit of a scoop. So a nice little idea of yours was to ask BBC Hereford and Worcester if they could lend us some of their uh, office space there at their studio. Thank you, me. Dears. Yeah, thanks very much for that. That was a great help. And so I went into BBC Hereford in Worcester and rang up Claire Short and had a chat with her about her Bakashi and her Bakashi bucket. I asked her really what gave her the idea of using Bakashi, how she was getting on with it, what she was going to do with her Bakashi treated waste. And I asked her whether or not she had any sort of other inclinations towards gardening. She wanted to know about other ways that she could compost. Apparently, she didn't have much success with worms. Did she? talks to me about in the interview. Interesting. Yeah, one thing I did did ask about sustainable development and she did say that sustainable development is just a phrase, which of course it is. Um, My retort was, I think I said something like, well, sustainable development is common sense. What I meant was that the principles of sustainable development are common sense. So I should say that, just to put it into context. Oh, I'm trying to alter the interview now, love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if uh, only we could all do that. Yeah, that's mm, right. Yeah, put things yeah. right after. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, just in case there are any listeners out there who haven't got a clue what the heck we're on about with regard to Bukashi, just give us a brief overview of the principle. But bakashi just means ferment in, in Japanese. We sell bakashi, which is a brand medium which has been inoculated with a culture of 80 different affected microorganisms, bacteria and yeasts. And when you use bakashi to treat your kitchen waste, your household waste, you sprinkle it on there, very clean, perfectly reasonable to handle, sprinkle it on your green waste and it holds it in suspension almost and you don't get any smells or odours off it. It's it's repulsive to rodents and vermin, interestingly enough. Mm. And you can take it out and you can bury it into your garden, bury it in your compost heap, and it decomposes so quickly because it, it's already been subjected to what is, in effect, a whole bunch of friendly bacteria. And it breaks down so quickly in the soil and it stimulates the existing microorganisms in the soil and makes nutrients so much more available to uh, plants. 
And here today, we have the very man who makes the stuff. <laughs> Bring it on, Farmer Phil. Aye, thank you all. Um, you've got a batch going at the moment, haven't you? Yep, we're just about to put the latest batch on the drying floor. It's nearly fermented. We've inoculated the bran and then we ferment it in airtight bags, effectively. Right. And then we have to dry it again so it'll actually have a shelf life. So that's what we're about to do. So we stick it on the drying floor and blow air through it, basically. It's as simple as that. Right. And how many tonnes have you been puthering with? We've done two and a half tonnes this time. Excellent. So that's a total farm production of five and a half tonnes mm. of bokashi. That's yep. a big... What, what's that in, in terms of volume? So Ooh. people get an idea. I mean, wow. there's a lot, isn't it? Well, I know that two kilos is about six litres. So two kilos is right. a big bag. Six litres, right, yeah. OK. It'll be... Oh, it would probably be six or eight cubic metres of it when it's dry. It's quite fluffy. Yeah. 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 Oh, it's certainly the biggest amount of bokashi produced in the UK. Oh, without question. Isn't well, there, you can see... A, a photo of you sat yeah. on a pile of bokashi yeah. in a new catalogue? Yeah, Michael tried to have me standing up in it. Yeah. But I, c- I couldn't bear the photo, so we've gone for one of sat in it. Yeah. Rachel and I went out and sat in it. That's a good picture, that. Um, could, and could it's have in been the new... The cashy was too deep, I think, <laughs> standing up. <laughs> oh, you're so funny, aren't you? Yeah. Um, it's in the new catalogue, and the new catalogue comes out. So if you'd like a copy of our catalogue, email us, heather at wigglywigglers.co.uk, or pop to our website, and yeah. you can uh, request a catalogue there. If you're an existing customer, as usual, it'll automatically land on your door, love. Anyway... Um, you wanted to know the prices of Bokashi, didn't you? I did. That was the other thing. Cause see, Claire asked me whether or not wh- whether I knew the price of Bokashi, and I didn't have a clue. Not the foggiest idea. Okay. I think she was surprised that I didn't know the prices <laughs> of a product that I was you know, talking about. But, you uh, should know you're not interested in money. I don't keep my money. finger on the price pulse at all. Of course right. not. Well, just to give you an idea, um, two kilos, which is a big bag, is about 11.50, or 600 grams is about 3.90. And how and long, that's how long from would that Wigglers last, or anywhere, you really. So if someone bought a two kilo bag, conventional household, yeah. how long would it last them, do you reckon? Between six months and a year. Uh, 600 grams lasts about two months wow. in a Bokashi bucket. So it's real value for money as well, isn't it? And well, you can use it all over the place, you yeah. see. So oh, it depends right. how you're going to use it. But sure. in a Bokashi bucket in the kitchen, it's going to last quite a long time. And if you use it in the compost heap in the garden, obviously, you know, you're going to get through more. Yeah. But we've just started mixing the Bokashi with chicken feed to help with friendly bacteria in the chicken guts. Right. And I know, Phil, you thought we should try experimenting with Bokashi for wild birds. Well, that's right. There's been quite a lot of work done with feeding Bokashi both to farmed poultry and pigs. They've measured positive responses from doing so, and therefore, logically, you would have thought that if the wild birds would eat it, then that might be a way forward and it would benefit them, healthy bacteria, healthy birds. Do you think that would help in terms of bird flu and all that, Rich? No, probably not, because bird flu is a virus. It might help in the sense that it improves the bird's health and might make them stronger to resist bird flu. I was going to say that normally that within a population, the population is tangibly more healthy. A lower percentage generally succumbs to any particular disease. There aren't many diseases that if a population catches it, every animal or every bird gets it. It's mm. usually a percentage, and that percentage seems to move depending on how stressed they are, how hungry they are, how healthy they are. So anything that benefits their health must be good for them, I would have thought. The thing that I would qualify all this chat with is, of course, you can make your own bokashi, and that's absolutely fine. In fact, there's some recipes that are available from us if you'd like to make your own. But if you're going to feed animals with it, you have to make sure that it's totally dry or you feed it fresh when it's wet. Right. Because what you mustn't let happen at all is for it to go in any way mouldy because that could cause many, many more problems than the good that it does. I see. So Phil's bokashi is dried to... About 12% moisture. Yeah. No more. So you can use bokashi in its wet form, but you don't want to feed it to birds if there's any risk that it could not last the time. I see. Anyway... Mm. Oh, we've gone off on a, a complete tangent. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. Right. Um, so now we're going to go over to the Claire Short interview.
To put our, our chat into context, I should say that a, a colleague of yours, Jessica, contacted me some time ago to ask me about whether or not Bokashi inoculated waste, especially meat and fish, could be put into conventional compost heaps. And then we realised that you purchased a Bokashi bucket and some Bokashi from us, and so I thought it might be a really nice opportunity to, to talk to you and uh, to get an idea of what inspired you, really, to, to start using Bokashi. Well, I'm trying, like I think many people, to be a bit more environmentally conscious. So, you know, changing my light bulbs, turning the heating down, turning off radiators. And then waste and all that sorts of landfill has been haunting me. So I've got two houses. I've got one with my mum in Birmingham and then my London place. And I've got some of these green cones in Birmingham where right. you just put in the stuff and it drains into the ground. Right. Um, and I was thinking, in my London house, someone does the garden for me and has traditional compost, but then you've still got all the meat and fish waste and so on. Sure. And I was thinking, can I get another green cone or is there something better? And then I had a, heard about worm compost, so I sent for a book about that, but then... Jessica, who runs my office, who contacted you, told me they'd tried it and all the worms had died. And then she told me about your Bokashi. Right. So that seemed to the, the answer to my, you know... The answer to your dreams. Absolutely. <laughs> making me more responsible, but feasible, and I could do it. And so I've bought them, and I've got my first full bin. Right. Excellent. And I'm just starting on the second one, and I'm terribly pleased about it. I've been telling my friends. I know somebody in Litchfield has already bought one. Right. Excellent. So um, now you've, you've obviously put your, your waste into your bucket and you've put Bokashi on it. Are you finding it sort of fairly straightforward and a fairly kind of simple, clean operation? Absolutely. Right. And, you know, the little tap and you let off the liquid and I like the idea of that going down my different drains, you know, cleaning them all out. That's right, yeah. But I haven't yet completed a cycle. I haven't got to the point where the bin I've put to one side has finished and then I put the compost on the garden I've talked to the Helen who looks after my garden and she's told me where to put it. Right. So I, ha I haven't done that yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, where do you think you're going to use it? Well, I've got a bit of the garden where there's some herbs and things, and she told me that was the place to put it, so that's what I will do. Fantastic, yeah, well, you should have some serious parsley, I should think. After. <laughs> well, I'd love some parsley, actually. Yeah. I've got some other herbs, but I haven't got parsley. I'd love to get parsley in my garden. It's it's incredible stuff, in actual fact, because once you've treated waste with bokashi, it really does stimulate plant growth. If you're able to have comparisons where you're digging in bokashi to certain areas of the garden, you compare the plant growth that where in areas where you are, it's just, it's quite astonishing, really. It does sort really stimulate the soil oh great so what should i do i put it on the top and then just dig it in a little bit yeah i mean what happens really you put the bokashi on your waist and then it's kind of holding the waste in suspension if you like sort of pickling it and or fermenting it mm. but the culture that's on the bokashi or the, the, the bran that's uh, that's the, the medium that the uh, that the culture's sitting on is a, is a combination of sort of 80 different um, microorganisms but friendly bacteria if you like mm. and what happens is when you dig that waste into the ground it comes into contact with the soil it sort of stimulates the uh, existing microbes in the soil and it breaks down the waste very, very quickly and makes the nutrients in the soil so much more accessible to plant growth. So this is a dream for gardeners? Absolutely, yeah, it is. It can, uh, I mean, can... I've come a bit because I want to be more responsible about my waste, but right. people who want a good garden should go for it too. Absolutely, yeah, it really, it, it really does. It makes the soil healthier, if you like. Well, how long plant after I put it abilities. in, would you recommend I plant the parsley? I think within, uh, certainly within a couple of weeks, I and mean, after you've dug the bokashi into the soil, um, you know, with it, within a couple of weeks it would be fine. And in actual fact, if you're doing something like, say, if you wanted to plant um, runner beans, then you could put the bokashi in a trench and then just cover it over a little bit of soil and then plant the beans onto it almost immediately. You know, you How deep right should on. I dig it in? Uh, well, you don't need to dig it in very deep. I mean, really, you, you're, you're treating the topsoil, so the, the medium that's going to support your plant roots. So, any, any, you know, within, I don't know, anything between sort of up to... 12 inches would be fine. 12 inches? 12 that's inches. Between, quite deep, between, I think. Do you think so? <laughs> I mean, that's it. That's it. Any, any more than that would be unnecessary. Yeah, so quite deep. 12 inches is fine. But the, but the beauty of Bokashi as well is that for some reason, there are the waste collections across the country that uh, distribute Bokashi to um, householders. And for some reason, the uh, the waste that's been inoculated with Bokashi is totally unattractive to rodents. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, and and which is another reason why you can you can sort of bury meat and fish having inoculated with bokashi because it's um it just becomes uh, you know totally unappealing to, uh, to to vermin in effect.
brilliant. Yeah. I mm. suppose I could put a bit... Do you know those green cones? Yes, yeah. I could put a bit of Bacassi in those, couldn't I, and speed you, up their rotting. Absolutely, it would really speed up the process. It would Very be. good. How much is a bag? Because I bought it all together with the bins. Gosh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much the uh, how much the, the offhand. I haven't got a, a catalogue of price list in front of me, so I'm not I'm not entirely sure. Um, roughly, don't you know? I, I don't know. Roughly, even no oh. no idea. You know, not, not a clue. But it's not. It's 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 very cheap. It's 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 incredibly inexpensive. Good people I'll get people some buy it. Well. Yeah, That's good. yeah. I mean, you can buy literally. You can buy um, great big bulk bags of the stuff because it's um, it's suspended. It's the, the cultures are suspended on bran. It's very very light. Mm. Um, so you know, there are, it's it's great for being able to package and send out very inexpensively. Brilliant. Um, I'm very pleased with it, and I'll get good. some for Birmingham as well. Have you good. got any other? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. Um, I mean, you, you, so you obviously didn't you didn't get on well with worms then? I did try it. I bought a book, and see the thing is, I also have to move my life. I'm in Bir- I'm in Birmingham Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then I'm in London Monday. But I'm in the House of Commons. Go home Monday night, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Right. So. I have to be able to keep everything going, but leave it for days. Right, right. So I don't know. I got I got a bit intimidated by the worms. The, do they, I don't suppose they use bakashi in the Houses of Parliament. Do they yet? Are they yet? Probably do, not. But no. I could make inquiries. They must have enormous quantities of waste. I'm sure they do. And even if it was just, um, you know, even if it was just used in in smallish areas, small waste containers for, for I don't know for for pickling their apple cores, for instance, for um, for for collections for um, you know community allotments, that would be you know. It'd be a start. It'd be a start, absolutely. Are there any local authorities that have taken this systematically and kind of giving every household the chance to there are their compost collection? There are. I mean, inter- interestingly enough, I was I was going to ask you uh, what, what role you think that local authorities and government can play in, in in encouraging people to adopt these kind of initiatives. But there's a I know for a fact there's a there's a, a an organisation called the East London Community Network, and they provide bakashi to households on lots of several hundred. different different uh, houses right across the right way across several different estates and uh, and they what they do is they is they give people the bakashi buckets they give people the bakashi and they put their household waste their, their green waste their organic waste in effect mm-hmm. into the buckets and they put their bakashi on it sprinkle it on there and seal it. and then there's a collection every week and they take it, it they take it away and take it to the parks or and they, they yeah what they do in actual fact is they put it they use um, rockets which in actual fact aren't dissimilar to your green cones mm. um, but they accelerate the decomposition process and uh, and then they turn it into fantastic friable compost that in turn gets distributed to various allotments and gardens and and is for sale and they found that they're they're able to create a product that they can sell. Oh, that's know. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's it, encourage other local authorities to do that. I mean, it seems that the sustainable development, it, I mean, it really is a, a sort of expression that's very much in the, in the public domain at the moment and for over, certainly over recent months for various reasons. And I was wondering, a person in your position, I was wondering how you thought that we can encourage as many people as possible to adopt the principles of sustainable development? I think personally at the moment it's just a phrase and nobody's living it. Right. Um, we're living in these very, very greedy consumerist times when people are buying more and more clothing and more and more gadgets and they're very, very cheap because they're designed in Europe, made in China or Vietnam or wherever. Yeah. So we all trot off these phrases, sustainable development, but we'd have to change our way of life very considerably That's if right. we mean it. Yeah. And I actually think people are getting sick of this greedy consumerist society. It's not making anyone happy. No, it's not. People you know, work long hours. They never see the people they love. They never have time for, I don't know, their garden or just taking pleasure in making things or, I don't know, reflecting on things. And I think there's going to be a kind of sweeping change in society when people turn away from this consumerist, glitzy, shallow kind of way of living and we go back to wanting to live more in community, know our neighbours more, be right. kinder to our families and friends. And people will get back to, I don't know, growing vegetables and going on the bus rather than having lots of cars. And We've got to do it, but it's going to be a big, big change, you yeah. know what I'm saying. You can't just say, I'm going to live exactly as I'm living now, but I'll 
get some Bakeshi and then I can call myself sustainable. I mean, in many respects, I think sustainable development is just all it is, is just common sense. And but I think you're absolutely right. People have got away from the simple pleasures in life. You know, the simple things in life are often the most... You know, the, the, that the, make you the most happy. Absolutely, absolutely. And Caring it's kind of striving... People, loving them and being loved back yeah. or just liked and regarded by your neighbours and yeah, yeah. music and... Much once more, isn't it? That's, uh, absolutely. We've got um, we've got an interesting situation at Wigley's. Um, we've got a series of courses this year. What we're trying to do is that through our podcasts, trying to raise awareness about the significance of, of healthy eating, and, um, and natural gardening, and you know various sort of environmentally friendly initiatives. We've got a series of courses. One of which we've got coming up in, in March, which is uh, it's called the Cow Shed at Night, <laughs> and, uh, and it's going to be it's going to be real f- lots and lots of fun. There's certainly lots of local people coming in, several people from away and it gives people the opportunity to come onto the farm and look at cows because Phil, who farms Blakemere, has suckling cows and uh, and it gives people the chance to come and look at the cows but also so experience bovine husbandry, if you like, but also look at the best cuts of meat. So it's almost like a, a sort of cradle-to-grave thing but it gives people a real chance to see how things are done. I think this is really good as well because... People are eating rubbishy food. You've only got to go in a supermarket and see some of the rubbish people buy, and then we're getting obesity and all these illnesses that go with it. And I think people get less pleasure from food. So as if we go back to appreciating the animals, treating them well, enjoying what they give us, and eating better quality in less quantity, I think, we c- and also families sitting down and eating together because they cook at home. Yeah. I think all these things... It's not just that it would be people would be good. I think people would get enormous pleasure from it and be happier people. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's uh, words of wisdom, I think. OK, well, I've got to say, again, thank you very much well, for, thank for speaking you. to and us. I it's hope nice I to speak to you. I'll come and visit you one day. Where exactly are you? That would be lovely. We're at uh, Blakemere, which is between Hereford and Hay on Wye, because I think you, you were up at the Hay Festival last year, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm coming to the Hay again this year. Could oh, you really? Call in and see you? You could. That would be lovely. It would be lovely to see you. And in actual fact, we've got some stuff on at Hay Festival this year. We've got a festival event there where we'll be talking about our new book, and uh, hopefully I'll be doing some talks up there as well, geared around sort of oh, like natural gardens. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll get in touch. And Please do. Well, I've got. Try and call in when it's the 27th of May. I'm coming. We're definitely going to be there because f- this week is the Hay Festival is after Chelsea, so we'll be around all week. So um, yeah, just let us know. And what I'll do in the meantime is I'll email Jessica and give her the lowdown on the the Bikashi prices. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, your no listeners problem. might want to know as well. No, I'm sure they yeah. probably will. <laughs> Next week. Yeah, all lovely. Right. Thank you very much, Claire. Bye-bye. Okay, bye bye. Well, Rich, what a star you are. You've got the first ever Wiggly podcast scoop with a star. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. I've got my own book review this week. You love that book. Oh, this book, The Farm by Richard Benson. The story of one family in the English countryside. I read this, didn't I, Phil? Four days, I reckon it took you. Four days and one very cold bath. Mm. You must read this book. This book is so moving. It's just fantastic. It's the story of a Yorkshire pig farm and how they built it up and eventually sold it. And it's just funny. It makes you laugh. It makes you cry. It's one of the best books I've ever read. It must be good. Because it was shortlisted for Richard and Judy's book club. All right. And now look what's happened. It's been shortlisted for Richard and Heather's. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather believe it? Well, <laughs> what do you do? Now, this is more than a milka. Yeah. I mean, this is a milka. It's a proper book. Spell M-I-L-K-A. Milka. Oh, you've got to read it, right? Anyway, I read this book and I finished it, I think, on a Wednesday evening. And I came downstairs, and the moment I'd finished reading it, Jimmy's Farm came on the telly. Yeah. And I started to watch it because I enjoyed last year's series of Jimmy's Farm. And I saw Jimmy and Michaela speak at last year's Wire Conference. Right. And they showed their pigs and whatever, so I was looking forward to it. And I started to watch it, and I can honestly say that I nearly cried. The irony compared to this guy's farming life, a genuine Yorkshireman, whose whole world has been changed by things that have happened to him, compared with Jimmy's farm, where it seemed to me that there was just pandemonium 
and it was not a real farm at all. No. And I'd like us to discuss that sometime in the future. I don't know what you two think. Well, I totally agree. We talked about this before because I'd said I hadn't seen the new series. Yeah. And I said, Sarah saw it, and, and she thought it was really good. And, and we were talking in the office, and you and Rachel said, no, what a, what a bunch of bobbins, really, and it's a bad reflection on farming. Bobbins? Bobbins, yeah, <laughs> bobbins. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, right, I'll, I'll watch the next one. So I watched it the other night, and I did think it was all a bit Mickey Mouse sort of lets the side down a bit. Again, I said that really, if people want to learn about how to, you know, small holding, how to breed wildlife, how to respect food and whatnot, then Hugh Fernie Whittingstall really flew the flag for that. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, because it's good watching entertaining, hmm. then people might get the wrong impression from, from Jimmy's farm. What do you think, Farmer Phil? I agree with, with what you both said. I was a bit concerned that um, I can genuinely see that Jimmy and Michaela have got attributes that are of great benefit both to their farm and farming in general. But I, at the risk of my own stock getting out as we speak, don't see the point in having stock and not fencing them in. The, the actual practical running of the thing seemed to be such a shambles that so much time was wasted and so much land was wasted. There's so much riding round and every field they showed you has got tracks emanating yeah, crazy, out into it? it where they crazy. drive all over the place. Yeah. And I just sort of think, well, the ideals are very laudable, but the actual practical running of the place is not there and reflects badly on the rest of us. I've spoken to a couple of farmers locally about Jimmy's Farm because, of course, everyone's watching it, and it's good entertainment, I suppose. Mm. And they just laugh their socks off all the way through it. Yeah. And it was only when I said to them, can you imagine the impact that this might have on a person who doesn't really know how a farm is? And they were like, hmm, hmm. Anyway, we mustn't bash other people's and ideas. Also, it, there, there are elements of it, such as higher than expected attendance to their open day, which there but for the grace of God, you know, the, the same thing could happen to us. And that, mm. that uh, you know, you really feel for them when that sort of problem comes Absolutely. up, I think. And, and in his defence, I was listening to him talk, he was talking to Johnny Walker on uh, Radio 2 the other evening about chickens, talking about the fact that his, his friends would rather go to Tesco's and buy a £3 chicken and then go to the cinema and spend eight quid on Coke and popcorn than they would buy a chicken free range perhaps or even organic chicken that's going to cost 10 quid but tastes like a chicken but i, I think that three he quid. knows as well as we do that education of the consumer into what they're buying yeah. is critical to both his business and ours i think absolutely but in some respects you see it's because of that element of incompetence you know it, it's i think it just conveys the wrong message you know it looks a bit farcical it does remind me what I learnt sitting on my father's tractor mudguard when I was very small, all those years just sort of trailing round in his wake. There was information going in, and whereas Jimmy had, comes from no farming background, he started from scratch, whatever it was, two or three years ago. Yeah. So that, that innate knowledge that you learn being brought up on a farm, I think that, that is the difference. Yeah, sure. Anyway, at the risk of us being overrun with visitors trundling into our farm and being unable to get out... We've got a series of open days on the farm starting this very Saturday with In the Cowshed at Night. Old Farmer Phil's going to take us round to see number 58, is it, Phil? Well, we, we, you'll see all of them, but of course there is the danger. I have had a strong word with them that they're all going to behave, but probably <laughs> after what I've said about Jimmy's <laughs> pigs, we can look forward to pandemonium. Hey, in the yeah, cowshed. that's right. Yeah. Uh, so that's Saturday the 18th. If you'd like to come along, you need to book because we've got a bit of a tea party so you need to book and then rich is running a whole series of courses throughout the coming months composting worms and we've got open days so go to the website and have a look and that's where you'll find richard benson's book the farm too so there we are right it's a job shutting these boys up they keep whittering on all the time when i'm trying to bring this show together so you naughty boys and you've been up to annoying each other again, haven't you? What's been going on, Phil? It's dangerous. Spill of beans. <laughs> it's dangerous. <laughs> I think what's going on is that because Richard's doing all the courses and so on through the summer, he's decided that he's going to invade the farm. And to that end... <laughs> Good boy. He's, he's <laughs> discovered my workshop. Yeah. Disaster. I was, I was under orders to a certain extent, I have to say, in my defence. But yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Who do you think? 
<laughs> so I I, uh, I wanted to put up a barn owl box in one of the sheds. And you've seen a barn owl, haven't you? I was talking mm. with Kevin yesterday and he said he's seen a barn owl a couple of times in the mm. sheds. And you've also seen, a, and we were talking about the tawny owl, weren't we? So I wanted to put a barn owl box in one of the sheds to give people, visitors, an idea of, of a typical situation for a, a barn owl box. And uh, Kevin gave me a lift on the on the forklift, put a pallet on the forks and hoisted me up about oh, health and 10 I was going to say, I would, oh, I would like to say that, of oh, course, yeah. Kevin used a, a man frame carrier to oh, hoist yeah. Richard up and not uh, a pallet at all. Yes, no, we, we hired all. a cherry picker <laughs> from the health and safety executive, yeah. brought it to the farm and Richard yeah. was duly hoisted up in it. I did. So I did that and walked all the way up muddy track and put up some tip boxes and, uh, and a tawny box on one of the tracks which will be part of a farm trail later on this year because there aren't any tip boxes now, and I'm pretty sure that a couple of those tip boxes will almost certainly be nested in. Whether the Did you put a tree creeper box there. up there, Richard? No, because I didn't. there are tree creepers up there and you will see them. Right, well, we could do that, actually. I might do that then. Well, you'll want to crack on, on, won't you? Yeah, I'm really, this is the time. This mm. is the time for nest boxes. I mean, any the birds are looking... I know at home now, I've been watching great tits and sparrows and uh, blue tits, inspecting all the boxes that I've got up at home. I'll tell you what I saw this morning. I watched a, a kestrel feeding this morning at home and it was... Picking up worms, it was it was landing on the posts, various place, places on the fence, and going down, picking up worms. It would sit there and hold the worm with its, its foot, and it would draw its beak up the worm, and then shake its head, obviously trying to get rid of the the mud and mucus off the worm. And then it was, and like a blackbird that sort of gobbles the worm back, it was pulling the the worm apart and eating it. Mm. Yeah, and really feasting because of course we've had this mild weather suddenly, haven't we? Yeah, wet and mild. Worms are on the top. Spring yeah. is springing. Spring is springing. Michael, Michael said, said he saw frogs yeah. in this one. Yeah. <laughs> How do you say it? Michael said he saw a frog spawn this morning and it wasn't there, it yesterday. Wasn't there yesterday. And no. he said he saw several males queuing up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like a night out down our local nightclub, wasn't it? Yeah. They, uh, there was, you know, one girl, ten males. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, of course, it's just, we've had a sudden mild spell. It's been so cold, hasn't it? I mean, it's been winter. We've had a proper winter this year, and it's been so cold. Suddenly, it's mild, and the frogs have come out, and they're, you know, they want to do their thing. So, uh, yeah. I fear they might regret it, because the forecast is snow tomorrow. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, dear. Now, just before we go, I must just tell you that yesterday, I went off into the w- Women in Rural Enterprise conference to give a talk you know, my public speaking career is really taking off. This is number two yeah. to delegates, 350 of them. Right. And so I prepared correctly. And as you know, Richard and Phil, I rehearsed five times the talk as directed by Heidi on the Shameless Self-Promoting Podcast. Yeah. Brilliant. I even booked a room to stay near to Utoxa Race Course. And Rachel and I went off, had a nice evening, a bit of salmon, Got up the next morning, set off at 25 past 8. We're 20 minutes away. The conference starts at 9.30. Oh, it's all calm. I do my last rehearsal. Off we go in the car and we put Tom Tom on. Tom Tom is our satellite navigation unit. Yeah. And so we keyed into it, Utoxeter, tick, race course, tick, and started to chat. We chatted and we chatted and we followed the instructions of where to go. Turn left at the bottom of the road. We have a male person telling us about the directions and a female telling us about the speed cameras. Mobile, mobile, she was going. After a while, we were discussing how wonderful it was. We'd actually, ten past nine, we'd got half a mile left to go. Oh, what a wonderful day. And it was then that we saw this cul-de-sac sign saying race course and it had directed us to a street name called race course <laughs> <laughs> not the race course oh dear but we chuckled oh happily and said how funny it was yeah. because of course we were still in new toxito weren't we and how, how, how much uh, how much time did you have to get to the place that you were supposed to be giving the talk to well i had to give point. the talk at 10 o'clock yeah and it's now 10 past nine and um we weren't in new toxito we were in Newcastle upon Lyme, <laughs> <laughs> which was farther away than where we started from. <laughs> and so then <laughs> came a c- complete race where every bit of saliva left my person 
and was sucked into outer space, Rach felt physically sick. Yeah. And we discussed whether or not we could phone Sam to, to get her to direct us to the race course or not. Yeah. I should add, Rich, that uh, Heather and Rach's chatting has in the past resulted in them ending up in Swansea on their way to Cardiff Airport. <laughs> oh, right. That you is, see how the truth comes out yeah, now. Yeah. That is true. It, yeah, it was when we oh, were going... That's the first time I've ever heard that. <laughs> we were going skiing and Rach said, it's Swansea. And I said, I'm sure that's after Cardiff, you know. She said, well, maybe the airport's just outside Swansea. And I said, wouldn't they have called it Swansea Airport? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so then we just went like maniacs to Utox to race course. And we arrived at 10 to 10. And I was on at 10 o'clock. And so, happily, I did make it. I delivered my talk. And it went down like a storm. Good, good. So, we got to go now, haven't we? Wrap it up, guys. Good job. Look forward to next week, then. Yeah, that's right. That's another week. Another week. More stick on supermarkets, I think. Yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you know that if you want to discourage squirrels, you put a small amount of paprika or cayenne pepper or chilli powder in with your bird seed, and the birds don't mind, but the squirrels hate it? Didn't know that. Bye for now. <laughs>